Two things happened in the early 1960s. The first was that we discovered that managing wildlife populations in finite areas is not an easy task. As the surrounding areas became more populated, mainly neighbouring impoverished rural communities, so too our job of confining the animals and managing them so that biodiversity was preserved intact became more and more difficult. And so the concept of adaptive management came into play. Adaptive management simply means to be able to control the populations of wildlife, especially herbivores, and especially selective grazers, to the extent that the habitat is retained as the primary management objective. Biodiversity and habitat management are inseparable. The early 60s found us grappling with the idea of impala, for example, at Mkuzi Game Reserve, growing in an abundance which threatened the habitat as a, a gesture to the farming communities, we started capturing impala alive at night using lights and offering them free of charge to the farming communities. Those were the earliest days in which the concept of ranching game for economic purposes took root in Zululand. An aerial survey conducted in the Imphalozi Game Reserve in 1953 by famed conservationist Ian Player revealed that there were only 437 southern white rhinos left on Earth. Swift action had to be taken by the authorities if the animal was to be saved from slipping into extinction. The white rhino had been accorded special priority management status in Amphalosi Game Reserve. All other competitive grazing animals took second place to white rhino. So habitat was managed for white rhino which resulted in a very short space of time, the 450-odd animals which Ian Player counted, growing to over 1,600 in the early 70s. Conditions in Amphalosi especially were threatening the habitat in which they lived. The late Dr Ian Player is credited with having pioneered the immobilisation and translocation of white rhino. Founder populations were established throughout southern Africa our sole market, once we had distributed the animals to various reserves around Southern Africa, was concentrated really on selling the animals live to overseas commercial and zoological gardens. When that market started to peter out, as a result of us selling over 1,500 rhino, the biologists warned that in a very short space of time we could expect mortalities to rise in the white rhino populations. It was unthinkable after having brought them back from the brink of extinction to now a stage where they were threatening themselves by eating themselves out of existence, we had to find another market. There was no market in the private sector. The rhino required a great deal of capital investment in fencing, bomas, uh, and there was still the chance then that the rhino, once placed on a 2,000 hectare game ranch, would escape and run amok in neighbouring lands, causing all sorts of problems. The thought was bandied about that perhaps the time has come to cull. And of course culling was part and parcel of adaptive management in those days. All animal populations had to be subjected to control of one kind or another. Kruger Park was doing it with elephant and buffalo. We were doing it on a similar scale. There was not a murmur from the public. The public simply allowed what was then the Natal Parks Board to get on with the job of managing the parks. For years, the white rhino had been accorded the ultimate protection, specially protected. It meant no hunting, no use whatsoever other than passive tourism. The solution to the problem of the white rhino surplus was to find a second market. The only way which we could find an outlet was to deregulate. We took them from the specially protected list and we put them on the protected list where they could be hunted under license. That was the start of an amazing industry. Once we placed an economic price on the head of the rhino, the rhino's attractiveness to the private sector for purposes of conservation, breeding, and with, admittedly with a certain amount of hunting thrown in, led to an absolute turnaround in the entire fate of the animal. All ideas of culling the rhino very quickly ceased as the demand grew virtually overnight. Only a fraction of the animals which were moved out of Amphalosi were actually hunted 
It was a case of a lot of ranchers realising that it was better to be independent of the Natal Parks Board and to be able to set up their own breeding herds that enabled them to in turn sell on rhino to other ranchers. The Natal Parks Board was very keen on sustainable use of wildlife. We began to go through a process of evolution where we first gave animals away, then we sold them at what we thought was cost price, and then we realised that we were giving animals too cheap. We watched the private sector, who were by then beginning to develop auctions, and we decided to follow the free market system, and we developed our own auction, uh, which became regarded as the champagne auction of South Africa, and certainly we got the highest prices and, and the highest turnovers, uh, sometimes reaching as much as 22 million rand a year. Every year from the protected areas, we remove three to 4,000 animals surplus to what the parks can maintain. That created the demand which allowed game ranchers to have an assured source of supply for wildlife. And it's on the basis that South Africa has created the greatest wildlife industry the world has ever seen. Our national herd at the moment has probably grown from about 2 million in the 1970s to probably about 20 million today. And that has all come from a period in the early 1900s when there was virtually nothing left of our wildlife resources. We had fed the country for the last three or 400 years and it just became humanity just overwhelmed that resource. The privatization of game animals and the ability to utilize the resource in both consumptive and non-consumptive tourism in South Africa was key to the explosion of wildlife numbers. Today, private game ranches and wildlife conservancies in South Africa cover 50 million acres, an area more than five times the size of the country's national park system. As soon as you get outside the very narrow core protected areas where tourists go, which is only about three or four parks in the whole of Southern Africa, most of the rest of the land is funded primarily by hunting. Ecotourism is a minor thing, meat's getting a bit bigger, sale of live game is growing because new areas are restocking, but I think the industry would collapse without safari hunting, in particularly high value hunting. 